before he produced the theory of relativity, people thought that light traveled through something called ether. So ether was the substance that was everywhere in space, even in vacuum. And light was a wave which was a disturbance of this ether. This was like pretty mainstream in like even in the early 20th century until this experiment came about this is called like the michelson morley interferometer i won't go into detail with the experiment because it's technical but i will just say that it disproved that there is any ether in our atmosphere and this sort of experiment i don't know if it directly influenced einstein but it this experiment had to happen for Einstein's theory of special relativity to be taken seriously. Welcome to Anteam Below, The Path Forward, a place where we discuss careers, products, ideas, and lives. Enjoy the episode. We have Manish Kumar. He's studying at University of Washington. He's pursuing his PhD. And today we'll be having a conversation on what does it mean to be an experimental physicist what are some of the characteristics that the job entails we'll be going about some of the key traits that a person should have in order to become one welcome manish welcome to anti bulo hello lalit thank you for having me hello everyone my name is manish i am a third year physics phd student more specifically i study condensed matter physics which is a branch of physics which i'm sure i'll talk more about as this podcast goes ahead sure so the first topic of conversation that we'll be going ahead with is your area of work in a broad spectrum introduce what your work comprises of and then we'll dig deeper so i study something called condensed matter physics a few decades ago this was what was called solid state physics so condensed matter physics stands in contention with particle physics which is the most popular form of physics so in particle physics you study a particle in isolation so whatever that particle might be it can be proton neutron quark lepton you study a single particle in a vacuum without anything present this is a powerful approach because it simplifies a lot of the problems and it has allowed us to learn a lot of things about the universe but there are certain phenomena which which will not occur in isolation a good example of this is superconductivity so superconductivity is when you have a metal and if you cool that down enough electricity can pass through the metal without any resistance so you get a zero resistance state now you will never get a superconductor if there is just one atom of a metal or with just one electron so this is what we this sort of phenomenon is called a emergent phenomenon the phenomenon can only occur because of multiple constituents of the system because of this ensemble of the system and condensed matter physics studies these kinds of large bulk or aggregate systems they can be just purely electronic system they can be molecules they can be like materials they can also crystalline materials they can also be polymers stuff like that that's what condensed matter physics is about so coming to your area of expertise that is so what types of projects do you work on what is the procedure to come up with the projects because i'm assuming that an experimental physicist job is primarily to come up with experiments to test various hypotheses so can you go a bit deeper into how you devise experiments how do you come up with them what type of projects do you work on sure that's a good question so yes so experimentalists what we do is we try to devise experiments to verify theories and not just that our experiments can also help us learn about new stuff which can give rise to new theories but the thing is that physics as a subject has existed for like 400 years now so all of your low hanging fruits have been accomplished so all the easy experiments have already been done so what is left over are these very resource heavy experiments like the LHC large hadron collider which requires millions of dollars of funding or experiments which are which we cannot do right now because of technical barriers and usually we have to whatever our system is we have to push the system to the absolute limit so just as an example all of my measurements are done at very close to absolute zero which is a 
about negative 273 degrees. We can surprisingly achieve this very easily and reliably at lab, but the reason we need this temperature is that everything worth observing at like high temperature has already been observed, so we have to go down to this temperature to observe the phenomenon that we are interested in. Same thing with magnetic field. We usually work around trout Tesla magnetic fields. So that is, I don't know if you're aware, but that is very high. I think the Earth's magnetic field is like 0.5 or 0.4 millitesla. I'm not sure. Maybe you should fact check me on that. But yeah, just briefly, we have to push the system to the absolute limit so that we can verify these predictions because these predictions that theorists are making are usually in these in these sort of exotic regimes which are not easily realized the systems that you're mentioning the systems that you're observing there's certain equipment that's been built to do that can you talk about the equipment that you use what's your role in probably developing the equipment or your role as in like an experimental physicist do they play the role in developing equipment that's used for observing at these extreme conditions give a sense of the ecosystem that surrounds this field of physics sure i can do that so there is a give and take between industry and our experimental physics so what i work in more specifically is i work with graphene heterostructures so the way we make these graphene devices is by using a lot of semiconductor microfab technologies, which have been perfected by industries, of course, electronic industries. So we are using something done by the electronic industries to help our research. But the whatever technology the industry has itself was originally developed by physicists who were working on studying these semiconductor materials. So there's like a good example of give and take between industry and experimental physicists. Another thing is that right now the project I'm working on is high pressure measurements of graphene devices. So these graphene devices, just think of it as a wire, but like a really small wire, a few microns across. So that's 10 power minus six meter across. But it's we can't just measure the resistance of it. We also need to apply high pressure. So high pressure measurement of these devices. That's what my project is. And we usually want to go to about anywhere from two gigapascal to five gigapascal. So remember one gigapascal is the atmospheric pressure. So we need anywhere between two to five times, two to five times of atmospheric pressure to observe interesting stuff. This, these kinds of experiments usually have never been done. Like we are doing it for the first time or they've been done very few times. And then we are doing some sort of incremental development. What I'm trying to say is that it's very novel. So as a result, we have to be constantly doing new things to accommodate changes and it is always in development and i guess that's where we come in even though i am a physicist 90 percent of the time in lab what i'm doing is i'm doing the job of say designing certain parts sometimes this involves actual machining or sometimes it can be electronic related so you're soldering wires or you're figuring out the best way to fit certain components so that's usually what experimental physicists do so you were suggesting a couple of things in your previous answer and one of the things that i take away from that is it's an ever-growing field you're always at the edge and you also mentioned some time back that you're conducting these experiments and pushing the systems to like their edge right like to the ultimate can you describe the challenges the obstacles that come your way both from a personal point of view as well as like from an equipment point of view how do you factor in these different scenarios these different factors sure so i can talk about my experiment that i'm working on right now the measurement the electronic measurement will be done at high pressure because you want to realize high pressure the sample space which is like the, it's like a cylinder in which your sample sits. It has to be very small because pressure is forced by area. And if you make the area very small, then the pressure is going to be large, even with the small force. So as a result, everything we do has to be shrunken down, which is one thing. The other thing is that because it's high pressure, you need your sample space to be blocked underneath. So what we do is we fill this cylinder with oil 
and then you press this cylinder down. So the cylinder actually I think, shrinks. I think you should explain what sample space is before you move forward. Sure. A sample space is just like a, it's a plastic cylinder and our device, our graphene wire sits inside and the graphene wire has like other wires attached to it. So metallic wires attached to it. So you apply a voltage and you measure the current, very simple resistance measurement. This entire thing sits, in a, it sits inside this plastic cylinder. The plastic cylinder is filled with oil, which is the pressure medium. And then you apply force on the cylinder with a hydraulic press. So that shrinks the cylinder. But because the entire thing is closed, the oil has nowhere to go. It is blocked out. So pressure builds up inside the sample space. That's how we reach a high pressure regime. But the thing is that the way we block it is we have to like epoxy the underside of the cylinder. Now, because we're dealing with high pressure regimes, this epoxy has to be very strong. And what determines the strength of the epoxy is what temperature you heat the epoxy, how much you mix two different components and how much of the epoxy you put inside. If the epoxy is not strong, then the oil will just burst through the other side. It's actually quite dangerous because you're applying tons of force on the cylinder. And if it's not completely strong, then it's like a small explosion waiting to happen. We need to make sure that the epoxy is completely filled and it doesn't fail at high pressures. Other things is that, so this entire thing, I told you we do our experiments at very cold temperature. So all of our components have to be compatible with that. So you can't have, so you can't have electrical connections which break at low temperature because at low temperature, the, the metal contracts, right? And because the metal contracts, there might be more stress on a solder joint, which might just tear off. So you have to keep all of these things in mind. The other very common thing is cryostat, which is like the fridge into which our sample goes in. It is in vacuum. So vacuum meaning very low pressure. And as a result, you can't have any oils or anything like that on the outside of our, of our pressure cell. Because if you put oil or something in a vacuum, it's going to undergo this process called outgassing, which is basically the liquid becomes a gas, but that is swallowing your vacuum, which will increase the temperature, which is searing with the experimental conditions, which is not good. So you have to keep all of these different things in mind. The good thing is a lot of this is part of sort of collective academic memory. So I didn't really have to learn all of, or I didn't have to figure all of this stuff from scratch because somebody else encountered this problem and it's just academic practice at this point. Some of it I did have to find out the hard way, but some of it you just find out by talking to other people or reading their research. An interesting point here is the details are abstracted out. You have to work with only the area of focus and not have to worry about the other aspects. The next aspect here that we want to discuss is now after designing an experiment, you get data. From data to information, what does that process look like? Now, when you think of physics, you think of first principles. But how do you incorporate these first principles? What is your thought process like? What is that process of going from data to information? Can you talk us through that phase of post-experiment? Sure. It is not that difficult. And we don't usually, especially when looking at experimental data, look at first principles as such. So what we usually look at is that you're a theorist, you've given certain predictions, and the experimentalist is trying to verify if those predictions are right or wrong. So those predictions will say, oh, the melting point of this substance is X, Y, Z. So you need to verify if the melting point is indeed that number. Or it could be something a little more complicated, like saying, oh, the resistance versus temperature of this particular material follows a quadratic scaling, in which case, the experimental data you would want to plot is resistance versus temperature and you'll need to fit a curve to see what sort of scaling it observes. Obviously, because we live in the real world and not in an ideal world, the it's not going to be a perfect fit. There's going to be some error margin associated with it, which is why just a single piece of evidence like this resistance versus temperature curve is not going to be enough evidence to make a claim. You have to like provide different amount of evidences, but that's usually how it's done. Again, institutional memory is quite strong here. We usually present data how it's always been presented, unless there's a good case to present it in another way. So you touched upon the field of theoretical physics. 
so it's a curious question now how does theoretical physics come up with hypothesis as in how do theoretical physicists come up with hypothesis and do you want to share some anecdotal stories or some events in the past where experimental physicists have disproven theories or have enabled theoretical physicists like what's the symbiotic relation here any stories or like any events in the past that comes to your mind sure i might have given this impression of this linear progression of events where oh the theorist sits in his uh, in his office and he thinks up these fantastical theories gives the predictions and the experimental experimentalist proves or disproves these predictions that is usually not the case a lot of times there is a cyclical connection between these two so the experimentalist might provide some data which might lead the theorist to make or modify his theory or make a different theory and then the experimentalist might prove or disprove that and the cycle keeps going on but i think one important point i would like to make is that all scientific theories have an unscientific origin meaning that every single scientific theory is based upon intuition a guess or an axiom which is not proven you can like expand this principle even to mathematics but the strength of a theory is solely based on the verifiable predictions it makes so these are predictions which can be verified by experiment so you can have a beautiful theory a perfect theory the theory of the world that explains everything but if it cannot make verifiable predictions then it will always just be a hypothesis it will not be a theory i'm sure you've heard of string theory which is very famous it's been famous for a long time actually but the problem that string theory today the problem that string theory is facing today is that they just don't have verifiable predictions they have theories which could possibly explain all different phenomena but they just don't have verifiable theories which is why a lot of people are beginning not to take it seriously at all as far as your second question goes which is an example of an experiment disproving the theory i guess the most famous experiment which disproved something is the michelson morley interferometer experiment so this is related to the origins of special relativity before albert before he produced the theory of relativity people thought that light traveled through something called ether so ether was the substance that was everywhere in space even in vacuum and light was a wave which was a disturbance of this ether this was like pretty mainstream in like even in the early 20th century until this experiment came about this is called like the michelson morley interferometer i won't go into detail with the experiment cuz it's technical but i will just say that it has a whole bunch of lenses and mirrors and it study the interference patterns in two different places and it disproved that there is any ether in our atmosphere and this sort of experiment i don't know if it directly influenced einstein but it this experiment had to happen for einstein's theory of special relativity to be taken seriously so the other thing about physics is there is lo- people hold on their scientists are very dogmatic so even after Michelson and Morley did this experiment there were like a lot of people still believing in the in this ether theory saying oh this might be because we're still on earth where you don't have a vacuum or things like that think up explanations to side skirt the observations of this experiment but i think this experiment was very important to the development of the theory of special relativity i'll also give you an example of of a positive case in which experiment proved a uh, theory you've of course heard of gravitational waves right so gravitational waves a lot of people did not believe can happen at all but then there you have ligo found gravitational waves which is what like i don't know 4 years ago so it can work both ways interesting we'll shift the conversation now we'll we we'll move towards aware uh, we'll try to understand what your journey has been so first let's get started with what was that thing that actually inspired you or how did you know that you wanted to move into the field of physics and what was your journey like to get to like the phd position so what were the various milestones in your journey do you want to like take us through some of the key milestones from your 10th standard or 12th standard why i was interested in physics was that it's just such a powerful tool so take for example your classic parabolic motion so you throw a stone and it goes in a parabola 
with just two or three lines of equation, you can locate where that stone is at every point in its motion. And I just thought that was just insanely powerful. And the math involved there is not that complicated either. And this is this is what attracted me to physics, a simple mathematical understanding of natural phenomenon. I think being able to understand how nature works and like this physics has this way of simplifying this that's what attracted me to physics and this, the other reason is that i was i was reasonably good at it at physics so that was the other reason what was the metric you considered to understand oh, that metric. you were good at it i just understood concepts i just felt like i understood concepts much more easily than others so for example there are, i don't know if you i'm sure at some point you've learned about optical lenses there are like to draw ray diagrams there are certain rules and i had wouldn't say i found those rules independently but when i read those rules it made sense intuitively again those rules are completely intuitive they don't have to like there's no logical basis for them but the whatever product they produce is indeed correct it is physically verifiable and in a way that's hard to explain physics just made sense to me more than any uh, more than any other subject okay and then what was your thought process like you pursued your bachelor's in pure physics is that right that is correct yes that is yes. correct so what was the thought process it wasn't really that complicated i wasn't really interested in engineering everybody around me wanted to become a computer science engineer and i that never really appealed to me even now computers don't really appeal to me i just i may be interested in what computers allow me to do in terms of my research but just by itself computers i don't really fascinate me to me they're just a tool and uh, yeah, getting a higher education in physics would allow me to learn more than whatever I learned in high school. The choice was pretty simple to me and I, I had the freedom to pursue an undergraduate degree in physics. So I just I took the opportunity. Yeah, and then the PhD phase of your life. So what was your thought process like? What were some of the key considerations? Why should, why would you go for a PhD, delve into these aspects? Sure. I wanted to do research and I did do some research in my undergrad and I wanted to continue the research I was doing. And the only real way I could continue doing my research was by getting into a, a PhD program and I don't, it's really hard to do research in physics unless you're part of one, a national lab or two, most of the time, this is like the option available for most people is to be part of a PhD program in a university. The reason is that, as I told you, the research we do is cutting edge and you need a lot of resources and a lot of equipment and these equipment are usually found in a university, sometimes in industry, although like people in the industry are not going to just give you their equipment to pursue your research problem as just a person physics. So also with, with the university environment, you have like other people who are also interested in working on the same problems that you are or similar problems that you are, which is, that is a nice community to have around. And there are professors who offer guidance, which has been very useful to me because Physics today is just so fast that it is very hard for one person to make an informed decision about things. Having this community is useful. Now, now that the physics, there's this general notion that physics has plagued you at all. How do you first prepare yourself in such a scenario wherein the rate of coming up with success is phenomenally low? In, in such a scenario, how do you prime yourself for success or how do you even go about your job? What motivates you and how do you look at work? Because for example, if you're looking at a computer scientist, they have deliverables, they can come up with applications. There's so many things that can be done. Uh, but in a physics, from a physics point of view, first of all, there's so much investment that's required. There's, as you rightly mentioned, you have to be under institutions. So there's institutional pressure and then there, you're also staying abroad. So there, there are so many different types of pressures. So how do you deal with it? What is, 
your outlook on that? I will say I, I do agree that at some level physics, the development of physics has plateaued, especially considering the, the kind of rapid progress that we saw in the early part of the, the 20th century. That being said, I still think that there's a lot of experiments that can be done. So a lot of tabletop experiments, tabletop experiments are experiments that can be done in a lab with, you still need resources, but it's not three different countries coming together to invest billions of dollars, maybe six figures. Those kinds of experiments still do exist. The, the problem is that somebody has to think hard and long about them. They have to design them. There might be some sort of technical challenges, which might have to be overcome. And that is where we come in. The other thing is that you have to engage with theory. So you have to look what the theory is saying. What are the theorist predictions? How can I test this in the easiest way? That is more or less the way I look at it. And so the theorist is making this prediction. I have these equipments. What is the easiest way to test this? Or what is the easiest way to prove this or to disprove this? So that is what is my motivation to design an experiment. But then you design the experiment and then you do the measurement and then the data comes out. So that part of it is staring at the data and then understanding the data and coming up with a conclusion. Is the data proving the theorists or disproving the theorists? What else is it saying about my system? And is there a way I can improve on this experiment? Is there a way I can extract more data from this experiment. This is what I think about. And in the larger scheme, it is really hard to have a set plan for success in academia. So you can do every single thing right, and you might still get a negative result in an experiment. Usually like a negative result means, so you hope that the system you're studying has this fantastic property. And if you discover this property, then you become like very famous or you become a good scientist. But that rarely happens, of course. A lot of it has to do with luck, really. And the thing is that even a negative result, even if you showed that this system does not have this property, that is still useful scientific fact. It might be underappreciated, but like in this huge body of scientific knowledge, someday someone else will appreciate the work you're doing, even if it is not immediately appreciated. And at the end of the day, like for me, science is about understanding the way things work, the way nature works. And that's what I want to do. It doesn't matter if like research leads to headlines or if it, well, funding does matter, but I don't have to worry about it right now. I just want to understand what is going on in the system. How can I understand it? How can I verify it? These are the things that motivate me. Let's shift the conversation a little bit. I want to understand how, what your journey has been on a personal side. That is, you shifted abroad. What has that journey been of going to a new place, learning new things? Does it help you become a better student? Or what are some of the challenges in that aspect? Yeah, I'm not sure if it helps me become a better Stood, but the big thing about moving to a different country is culture shock. I will have to say that I think I'm still undergoing culture shock and I have not appreciated it. First, when I moved here, I was actually quite optimistic. I was like, it's not some obscure country, it's the US. We consume US culture every single day, so it's not going to be that different. But it was very different, mainly because it's quite hard to find something in common between you and like people from that country. So usually when you meet somebody, you talk about things you have in common. I don't know, you watch, you support the same sports team or you watch the same movies or read the same books or listen to the same music. And that wasn't the case here. It was all very different. And some people might just take the approach that, oh, I'm in this country, so I want to listen to what they listen, watch what they want, see the same sports, things like that. But you might not want to do that, in which case it's hard to meet people, to make friends. But I do think that as long as you don't completely isolate yourself, you can always find something in common and it's not that difficult. My experience is that I did not really have problems making friends or finding things in common. I am I will not say I am completely assimilated into the U.S. culture or that I completely understand the U.S. culture. I don't think I ever can be. Slowly just 
living in a place for a long time has its effect. Other than that, I didn't really face any challenges. If anything, things became super easy after I moved to the U.S. Like the academic culture in the U.S. is it gives you a lot of freedom which is nice compared to India. You, a lot of the time you get to pick your own courses. The rules are very relaxed. The amount of work, most of the times, the amount of work I was doing in was much less and the work felt meaningful, more meaningful in a way that it didn't in India. What I was working on seemed connected to what I actually wanted to do. And in a way, like I liked moving to the U.S. because it pushed me out of my comfort zone which I think is most is very important for most people because you live in India, you have your family there, you have your relatives and you have like your close circle of friends and like you can live your entire life without meeting a single new person with because there are all these people there that will always help you. So there's like a whole lot of things that you will never have to do in life, which moving to a different place like you will be faced with that reality and to adapt to it exactly that the moving out of your comfort zone that's exactly why i phrased the question like that did it help you become a better student i feel it has molded you in fact anyone who moves out there or steps out of their comfort zone there's this you're primed to become a better student now because you're more aware you're more ready to learn so let's talk about your motivations and your future what you look in your future so let's come to that if you could probably so let's start with a hypothetical question if you could solve any mystery or any problem that has been like on your mind or any scientific problem that's been on your mind what would that be and why sure yes i do have a problem in mind this is related to quantum mechanics a lot of people have the, uh, they don't really understand quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is just, it's just physics at a, a certain scale. So when you go to like microscopic scales, so when you go to the level of electrons, physics just changes. And that description is called quantum mechanics. It's just a way of doing things. That's what quantum mechanics is. And I'm sure you've heard of this in Quantum mechanics are not point objects, they're wave functions, which means they're actually probability density waves. They are a distribution, a probability distribution saying, oh, the probability of finding this electron at this place is 0.5, at this place is 0.1, at this place is 0 0.001. And if you add all of those probabilities, you're supposed to get one. So the thing is that as long as nobody's observing the electron, it is in a superposition, meaning that this electron is at every single place in whatever coordinate space you have. But when you observe that electron, it the wave function collapses into a certain point. So let's say you're observing it at x equal to 1 meter, and if you find the electron, the wave function has collapsed at x equal to 1 meter. If you don't find the electron, it has collapsed somewhere else. This is called the wave function collapse idea. But nobody really knows what causes this wave function collapse or what happens if no one is observing. Or even if like we don't understand what is an observer, like does it have to be a conscious person? Can like a wave function collapse be triggered by an animal or like an inanimate object? The mainstream hypothesis right now is that it's actually quite surprising that at a microscopic level, before you observe it, so an electron before you observe it just does not exist. So the conventional explanation is you cannot think of anything before you observe it, so don't waste your time doing it. Don't waste your time thinking about what happens before you observe it. Think what happens after you observe it. So there's this common phrase that, that is used that shut up and calculate, which is associated with quantum mechanics. So don't worry about how it happens or why it happens. Just shut up and calculate. This is the explanation associated with Niels Bohr and that whole group of scientists. They buried this and anybody who, who tried to provide an alternative explanation, who tried to explain why this wave function collapse happens or what the exact mechanism of this wave function collapse is, they were ostracized. 
like their careers were ruined, things like that, mainly because quantum mechanics, even back then, was such an important theory. It solved so many problems. It is so strong. They were afraid that you have built this entire castle of glass on this thing, that if this quantum mechanics is proven to be false, then everything falls apart. As I said, scientists are quite dogmatic, much more so than normal people think. So they didn't want to hear anything about it. They didn't want to hear a whisper of quantum mechanics being false. So they did not even allow people to dig into the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Like what exactly is a wave function? Why does a wave function collapse? Why or what the mechanism of wave function collapses? So this is way far out, but I would one day I would like to do an experiment or at least think about what the how these things might happen. Yeah, there are actually quite a lot of theories floating around. Like you might have heard about like the multiple world hypothesis. So that says that, oh, you have a wave function. So a wave function exists in two superpos- superposed states. So if you observe this wave function and it collapses into one state, that means there's an alternative universe where it collapses into another state. So every single observation is giving rise to alternative realities. This is, I don't know, Marvel comic book. Very, It has that sort of feel to it. But I'm sure like, I would like to see if this can give us a verifiable, verifiable hypothesis that can be verified by experiment. So current status of quantum mechanics is it's not observable. Is that the right statement or it's partially observable? It is observable. Quantum mechanics has very real physical proof. The point I'm trying to make is that whatever physical proof we have is only after this wave function collapse has occurred. We have no idea what happens before the wave function collapse or how it happens or why it happens. And that's what I'm interested in. And like the mainstream explanation right now is you should not worry about what happens before a wave function collapse or why it collapses because it's giving you the correct results. But I think it's just natural curiosity, right? Your entire theory is based on this fact, but you don't understand why this is happening. I think that's like the most natural question to ask. And it's a, it's a fundamental question. And there's like very few fundamental questions left in physics. I would love to have a discussion with you on what are some of the fundamental questions. We will keep that for another time. Let's get into the personal and professional goals that you've set for yourself. How do you look at what is the natural progression for you in your professional life? How do you want your personal life to cover this or enable your professional life? What are your thoughts on that? I don't really have any fixed long-term goals because I like to be flexible in that way. So for example, whatever system I'm working on, I would like to finish my experiment. I would like to finish my project. Hopefully I'll get some fruitful results of it, but I will not like to be chained to this system. If there is a system that I am much more attracted to, if there is a system which I think will allow me to do better experiments, I am more than happy to switch systems to learn about that. So one thing that I'm interested in that hopefully I can get to work on at some point is biophysics, the physics of life. So a lot of a lot of physical laws just don't apply to biological system, to living systems. I think a good example of that is this is like very superficial view, but like superficially the second law of thermodynamic does not apply to living systems. So at every single level of complexity, there's just different laws and we just need to figure out these different principles. Yeah, I think I would like to study biological systems one day. I don't know, as far as my personal life goes, if I think that industry offers better research opportunities, then I will switch to industries, no questions asked. Yeah, I don't like to be constrained in my options. One one thing I observed today is after, like during the conversation, there were these points, moments in time wherein certain aspects of it had a certain philosophical bent to it. Like even now when you were talking about not being chained to something, that 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 is having the freedom to navigate around your field and then probably even the abstractions that you were talking about and then the entire field of coming up with experiments or the field of physics where there's you might think that everyone has figured things out but then you're talking about a problem where the solution is shut up and calculate it's very interesting to even think about these from an aspect of like how people approach life like I'm looking at physics and seeing that there's a huge projection of that here and it's like it's in a way 
there is a scientific process to go about things to go about coming up with experiments but at another level when you look at it from a larger level it's still ad hoc so probably that's something that the viewers can take as a take as a outcome from this conversation thanks manish thanks for doing this this was a great conversation like we got to understand the ins and outs of experimental physics i have a lot more questions probably we can take it up in the next episode thank you viewers thank you for joining in see you thank you bye